Okay, so we are just going to jump in. So welcome everyone to the second webinar of the BCRC webinar series, um, Setting Records, Calving Data, Calving Season Data Collection. Uh, my name is Sydney Fortier, and I am the BCRC Extension Coordinator. Um, and we are very happy to have you guys all with us today. Uh, we are happy to provide our free webinar series um, through our Knowledge Dissemination and Technology Transfer Project, funded by the Canadian Beef Cattle Checkoff and Canada's Beef Science Cluster. Okay, so. Uh, if you have any questions that come up during the webinar, we highly encourage you to, um, to ask them. We will have a live Q&A session at the end of both of our presentations. Um, and just a reminder, please ask those questions through our Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you put them in the chat, unfortunately, we won't be able to get to them. Um, so yeah, uh, another reminder that this webinar will be recorded and the uh, recording link will be sent to all those who are registered, not just those who have attended live. So if you know someone who wanted to attend live and wasn't going to be able to, but did register, they will receive the link to the recording following the webinar. So for those of you who haven't already, we highly encourage you to subscribe to our blog. Um, we have um, tons of announcements on new research and we provide timely information and just keep you updated on what we've been up to. Um, so if you guys subscribe, we actually are launching our new series, um, CAF 911, um, starting with our tube feeding video and will be followed by four other videos focused around um, calving season and calf management. Um, so if that's something that interests you, please subscribe to our blog and stay up to date. On our website, we also have decision-making tools, and I'm just going to highlight these two for you guys today. So we have our cow-calf production indicators calculator. So this one um, allows you to enter your own production numbers and then be able to compare them with um, the industry target as well as your regional benchmark. Um, and these numbers are coming from our most recent regional cow-calf surveys. So as you see the highlighted yellow, that's the information that you will input on your own and then be able to determine whether you meet or exceed the target or are below target on that particular parameter um, in terms of industry targets or your regional benchmark. Our second one, um, the value of calving distribution. So this calculator allows producers to see what their current calving distribution is and the impact on your revenue would be if you moved to um, the industry target, which is a 60, 25, 10, and five, or a more condensed breeding season of three cycles. So as you can see here, the first step is to enter um, your actual calving distribution for each 21 day cycle then enter the ideal calving distribution, and step three is to see your results. And these results are in this format. So you're able to look at the difference in total return compared to your current calving distribution, your calculated weaning weight by age group, and your estimated average weaning weight and total returns. We also have a record keeping and benchmarking resource under our resources tab on our website. So this is where you find it. Um, so it basically just goes over the basics of record keeping and not only that, but why it's important. Um, and it's broken down into three different levels. So the first level being just a great starting point if you aren't keeping records, um, how to start and what to record. Um, level two builds off of this information and gets a little bit more in-depth look at um, animal health and performance, your forage and grassland, your genetics, um, as well as a financial breakdown of your operation. And then level three, again, builds off of the information from one and two and gives you a really um, inside look up to what the numbers mean. Um, and yeah, gives you more insight on your current operation. This webinar is also available for one continuing educa education credit um, for RVTs and vets. 
Um, yeah, so we have um, this one that's available. Our next one that will be available is the Yone, roll, don't roll the dice with Yones. Um, we did offer um, continuing education credits for the backgrounding webinar, which was held in November. Um, and we are still offering continuing education for that one as well, um, retroactively by watching the recording, which will be available for this one as well. Um, if you have any questions regarding how to get this continuing education credit um, or on how to get your certificate, please reach out to myself or Dana Parker. We also have tools and resources for VET teams. Um, you can find it on our website under the resources tab here. And here you can see relevant content and sign up for our VET newsletter to stay up to date on new or timely resources provided by the VCRC. Um, and these ones are specifically tailored towards VET teams. Um, so it's yeah, pretty on target and uh, we hope it's a useful resource for you guys. So we are very excited um, to have two incredible speakers this evening, um, Dr. Jennifer Pearson from the University of Calgary and Mark Heimer. And they will be discussing the science and application of good record keeping on cow-calf operations, specifically during calving. Um, and again, before we start, I just really want to encourage you guys to stay connected with us at BCRC. Um, we're on Twitter and Facebook. Um, we're on YouTube as well. That's where uh, our recordings will be posted. And you can sign up for the Canadian Cattlemen's Action News for up-to-date industry information. Um, and again, if you haven't, subscribe to our blog. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our first speaker. So Dr. Jennifer Pearson graduated from Oregon State University with a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Animal Science. Afterwards, she received her DVM from Oregon State University College of Vet Med. Upon graduating, she started a one-year internship at Cornell University in ambulatory and then stayed for a residency in ambulatory and theriogenology and became board certified in theriogenology in 2018. Jennifer completed her PhD at the U of C, investigating the impacts of calving management, calf risk factors, and difficult calving on the health and performance of beef calves. She then worked as a postdoc scholar and sessional instructor at the University of Calgary, investigating beef cattle behavior. Jennifer recently started an assistant professor position at the U of C faculty of vet med in bovine health management, where she splits her time between teaching vet students and research. Her research interests include peripartum diseases, neonatal care, and bull health and fertility. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Jennifer Pearson. Thank you, Sydney. Can you hear me okay? Perfect, okay. Next is to share my screen. Just bear with me for a minute while I get this up. Okay. Perfect. And Sydney, can you still see my screen? Did that all go okay? Yep, everything looks good. Perfect. Well, Sydney did a great job introducing um, lots of opportunities and, and software out there that are available to producers on how to use your, your data to make better, better decisions. So I, you know, she, she did a great job and there's these great resources out there. Um, I'm going to sort of start from the basics and build from there and, and have, a, I'll have a couple of examples in my part of the talk, but then Mark will jump in and, and talk from a producer standpoint, as far as what sort of data does he collect and how does he use it on his ranch as, as more examples go forward. Um, first and foremost, I, I, as Sydney said, I'm an employee of the University of Calgary, and so I don't have any other financial interests besides being a, a teacher and a researcher there. Um, I'm just going to click, get this 
out of the way. Okay, so first question I always like to, to ask producers when, when we're talking about data, and, and I ask my students this too, is, is why are we collecting the data, right? That's that's the big question. And so producers usually, the, starting from, from more of a level one, it's to monitor their inventory and their production. So how many cows do they have? How many calves were born? Um, you know, what, how many calves did they assist? Pr production questions like that, okay? But we can also use data to answer other questions as well that we have. So we can use it to investigate herd problems. So maybe there's a question about the number of calves that were assisted at birth or the number of calves that, that are developing scours, okay? Without appropriate data and, and writing these numbers down, it's hard to answer those questions. We can also use data to look for areas of improvement as well. So we have a lot, I'm gonna go through a bunch of benchmarking examples and there's a bunch of great benchmarking tools that Sydney talked about already on the website. Um, but we can use those benchmarking tools to look for areas of improvement in our management. So where can we do a better job, be more efficient, be more productive in, our, in raising our calves? And then lastly, monitor our management changes. So maybe we find an area to improve and we decide to make some, some minor or major management changes. So how do we know that those changes are actually doing good or, or are we actually improving what we set out to, to improve? And without collecting the appropriate data, it's, it's hard to answer those questions. So we're gonna go through, hopefully the, the short part of my talk talking about how we can use, use data in these different areas, okay? It is also really important for, for measuring our production goals too. And we, we call them SMART goals. We wanna create these SMART goals. I think I've seen this um, in other beef talks. We talk about this with our, our vet students all the time. We talk about this with producers and, and with our research as well, okay? When we, when we wanna make a goal to improve something, we need to follow the SMART protocol. So it needs to be specific. So we can't just say, I wanna improve calf health. Okay, what, what does that tell us? That doesn't really tell us a whole lot. We need to be more specific and say, you know, I want to, I, I don't like that the number of scouring calves that I have. I want to see if I can make a management change to lessen that from, you know, 8% of my calves being treated for scours down to 4% of my, my calves being treated for scours. So being, being very specific as we can. Also a big part, what, what this talk is all about, it needs to be a measure, measurable goal too, right? So we need to be able to collect numbers, collect information on that to see if we have achieved that goal and, and if we're making progress towards that goal as well. It also needs to be attainable and realistic. I, I would love to be, say, you know, my goal is to be a millionaire tomorrow, um, but you know, I don't buy lottery tickets and, and in research and academia, probably not likely to become a millionaire tomorrow. So probably not very attainable and realistic, okay? Same thing goes with our cow-calf production examples as well. They need to be realistic. We're not gonna go from changing longevity and, and a certain characteristic in our, our mature cows overnight, or even in one production setting, right? That's gonna take a couple of years to change the genetics within our herd before we might start to see something. So make sure that those, those goals are attainable and realistic, and then also time-based, right? Is this something, a change that we can make within one calving season or one yearly production cycle, or is this a change that is gonna take a couple of years, like I said, if we're talking about longevity to before we start to see these, these changes? Okay, another big thing when it comes to data, and, and I'm sure you've all heard this before in, in other talks too, is garbage in equals garbage out, okay? So how we collect that data, how we record it, what we do with that data, um, you know, how, how we put it into whatever sort of system we're gonna collect it, it really is gonna determine what sort of output we have. And so one of the things that I probably see the most with cow-calf producers is that you just get so busy, especially during calving time, and you forget to write things down. And when we forget to write things down and they don't get recorded, then I'm not saying that it's garbage, but there are outputs. So let's say we're looking at, again, calving assistance, right? It was the middle of the night, for the last couple calvings, you didn't get a chance to write them down because it was midnight and you wanted to get back to bed. Completely understandable, right? But if we don't write that information down, then when we go and look at these numbers at the end of the, the season or the year, they might be underestimating what's actually happening. It might be masking a problem that we might be having, okay? Same thing goes for, for measuring other things. So for an example, um, birth weight of calves, right? If you've got five different uh, people measuring, estimating calf weights in different ways, 
then we're not going to be really, we're not going to have very good reliable data at the end to when we try and look at that information and understand what our average birth weight is of our calves, especially if we're trying to look and see if, if that's related to a problem that we're having either. So when we're thinking about data, remember garbage in equals equals garbage out. So put good data in and you'll get good, good results and, and reliable results out in the end. Okay, and also that leads to, to the two big questions as far as garbage in, garbage out is one, how will you record your information? And two, what information will you, will you record and what will you use? Okay, and so I actually have a poll right now, Sydney, we'll go ahead and, and pull the audience. And so no one's gonna be graded on these, I, I promise. It's just purely my, my curiosity, um, trying to get to understand the audience a little bit better. But how do you, how do you record your calving data? Okay, so do you, do you not record any information at all during the calving season? Do you write it in a notebook or, or keep paper records only? Um, do you keep paper records and then transfer it over to a computer system, like maybe a spreadsheet? Um, do you use an Excel spreadsheet or some other spreadsheet and enter it directly into the computer? Or do you use some sort of calving software like Herd Tracks or CalfBook or CattleMax? There's hundreds out there, so um, pick, pick one. But um, yeah, please fill out the, the survey. We'll wait a few moments here. And once the... The numbers start to slow down. Sydney will put up the, the results. Perfect. Okay. So there's a few of you who don't record anything at, at Capping. Majority. So 45% are gonna do paper copy only. Um, another good chunk of you do paper copy and then transfer it over to a computer. Um, and then fewer are gonna use either a spreadsheet or, or a cabin record software. Perfect. This is this is what I, I wanted to know only because um, I'm, I'm curious about, about who's out there and, and, and at what level of uh, instruction might, might I, I talk about. So I want to, this is just the question that we just had. I want to share with you some information that we collected. So we did a benchmarking study um, through, at the time it was the Western Canadian Cow-Calf Surveillance Network. Now it's the Canadian Cow-Calf Surveillance Network network or C3SN. Um, and what we did is, is we had about 100 producers. They were either in Alberta, Saskatchewan, or Manitoba. And we asked them a bunch of questions about what they recorded at calving. Uh, we asked them about incidents of, of things like calving assistance and, and calf health and, and how they manage their, their cows and calves during the calving season. And so one of the questions that we asked them is, how do you record your information? Now, this population is going to be a little bit different than, than the group that, that is probably here tonight. The group of producers that filled out that survey, one, they needed to be collecting records of some sort because that's how we got our data in order to, to look at these benchmarking scores. And also, they, they were generally herds that had at least 100 cows or more in, in their herds. So, so generally a little bit, little bit larger herds. But what we found is actually pretty similar to the population of, of people here who are here tonight and listening. So yeah, the majority um, are keeping paper or notebook type records. Um, about a third are, are putting it down on paper and then transferring it to a computer and very few are using a computer directly or, or handheld device. And none of these are wrong. They all work in, in their own way. Um, Mark's going to talk about his experience of, of transferring through going uh, using the calving notebook or paper into going to computer and, and online directly. Um, and, and I think that's a great example of, of how, how he's learned to use the data to help him and, and his herd. And so I, I, I you know, one of the points to make here is that there's nothing wrong with keeping paper records only. I'm one of those people who, if I'm sitting in a conference, I'm taking handwritten notes. Uh, that's what I feel comfortable with. It's harder, though, to have immediate results when you are looking at paper records only, right? So either we're going to have to do a lot of hand calculations or we're going to have to enter all of that information into some sort of a spreadsheet or computer 
program to then calculate some of the numbers and, and benchmarking numbers that we're going to talk about later. And so there's lots of lots of resources out there. Sydney talked about there's two really great ones that are offered through the BCRC um, that can help you start to take some of these next numbers that maybe you start recording on paper and then start transferring them over and using a computer type program to give you some of these outputs and numbers so that you can better manage your herd and understand what's going on a little bit better too. So perfect. So then I have a second poll, right? So, so the second poll is what data are you collecting at calving? And I'm trying to just focus around calving because I know there's a lot of other information out there that we collect as far as vaccines and, and body condition scoring and, and pregnancy rates and all of that. Um, and this one is just check all check all that apply. So if you if you record more than just one of these things, check all the boxes. And we'll give you again a few moments. Again, this is purely curiosity from, from my standpoint, just to see what you all are, are recording. Uh, unfortunately, the poll is only letting them choose one option, so it oh, might be shoot. a little bit. <laughs> okay. So well, show well whatever it's whatever it's yeah. We can go and see what what people clicked. I guess probably they'll click the first. It'll probably be the majority of the first one, the first option. Then, unfortunately, go ahead and, and throw up the results, and we'll see. We'll see what what it looks like. Yeah, so it's probably, and, and that's probably one of the, the most commonly recorded uh, pieces of information producers would, would record anyways is, is the calving, calving date. But yeah, I was trying to get a, a sense of as far as how, how much of or how many of those um, pieces of information you, you all um, collect. So we'll move. Oh, I could probably, I can just edit it here quick and then reshare it if you're interested in that, unless you wanna move on. Uh, sure, why don't you edit it? I'll talk about this slide and then we can put it back up. Yeah, because I, I think it'll be, be interesting and hopefully this won't skew anybody's uh, results or, or what they do anyways. But again, so, so I talked about that benchmarking study that we did when we were recording what producers um, or how they collected their informa information. This is what they told us that they actually recorded. So the big three were date of birth, calf identification number, and cavity score. Although that's only about three quarters of, of the producers actually record whether or not the calving was was difficult or gave it a more specific number there. Less than half actually recorded birth weight. And so I'm going to talk a little bit, I'll have a slide here and in a little bit talking about ways that we can use birth weight to make decisions um, on our ranches. And then less than 5% collected any sort of extra information at birth. So things like the calf sex, its coat color, utter score, damn temperament, um, things, things like that, less, less than five collected that sort of information. And so I, again, I'm just sort of curious what, what our participants are doing. Sydney, do we have that available? Otherwise we can move on. Yep, it's about to launch. Ah, uh, perfect. So yeah, so select as many as you, you do. Like I said, I'm just curious to see how, how the audience is, is in comparison to this study. This study was a couple couple years old too. It was published in 2019. So
All right. Oh, wow. There are, there are a lot of responses. Good. So yeah, the big ones, calf birthday, calf ID, or, or sorry, yeah, birth date, uh, about 50% calf birth weight. So similar, similar to our, our study, Cabby knees, 80%, calf sex, wow, 95% of you. That's, that's interesting. That is quite a bit different than, than what we found. Um, color and vigor, about 40 to 50% vigor. I love to see that because that is an area of my research that I'm quite passionate about. So glad that people are recording that because I think it's very useful, useful information. And I know there's older uh, webinars that talk about calf vigor and how you can use that as well. Great. And then, yeah, looking at our, our cows and, and, and as far as utter and, and temperament going forward. Great. Perfect. Um, okay. So some of the big questions that I get from, from producers as far as, you know, what do I, I'm collecting this data, what do I do with it or what can I do with it? So one thing you can do is, is, is use it to, to say, well, where do I fit in the population of cow-calf producers, right? And Sydney did a great job of showing some of the resources that we have uh, on the BRC website where you can put in your numbers. So the, the information that you collect. So whether it be number of calves assisted or weaning weights or birth weights, um, lot, lots of different options there. And then see compared to these benchmarking numbers where you might fit. Now benchmarking numbers are, are usually an average as to the region of where you're at or maybe the country of where you're at and, and what producers are recording or, or doing. Um, it can be management decisions. It can be data decisions, like I said, birth weights, uh, calving assistance, and, and things like that. And as, as I've got here, there's lots of, lots of resources. Like we said, the BCRC, I've worked with the C3SN. Um, one of the big places before the BCRC and, and these other websites started to create these benchmarking results for Canada, we had to get a lot of our information from the US. So through the, the NOMS, the National Animal Health Monitoring System. And so that, that was a survey system where they would um, survey producers every five to 10 years on their management and, and in, um, yeah, number, of, number of animals and, and production and things like that. But it's nice to see that we now have Canadian numbers, that, especially regional wise too, that can fit in with, with the production type that we do up here in, in Canada. And so I always have a little caveat when I'm talking about benchmarking, whether I'm talking to students or producers. Um, benchmarking is a great tool for guidance, um, but it's not an end goal. And what I mean by that is that I'm going to show you some numbers here and there's some, some numbers on, on the website um, as well that are going to say, you know, yep, you, you're, you're right on target with where we would expect you to be in comparison with, with the rest of the, the population of cow-calf producers. Um, but it's not an end goal, right? We can always do better, I, is, is what I like to say. So if our calving assistance benchmarking guide is to say, you know, let's try and get below 5% assisted calves, you know, I think with some management changes and, and other changes, we can, we can improve on that and we can get that number lower. So once we reach that benchmark, it's not that we stop. I, I think we can, as an industry, keep growing and keep improving. The other thing to note too, is when we're looking at some of these numbers, is that they may be skewed by, by a few farms. And, and how I like to describe that is, is that we have a lot of farms who are very similar and doing things very well. And then there's always a few farms that need some improvement or need help in certain areas. And that's fine. That's, that's why we're here is, is to help each other out and make improvements. But sometimes those few farms that maybe had a bad outbreak of scours one year or respiratory disease, they can kind of skew the data a little bit with benchmarking. And so again, I always, I always try and, and make sure that producers and students are are aware of this is that they're, they're good guidelines. They, they help us, you know, if we're trying to set goals and we're not quite sure where to start, they help us get started. But again, we can always move past those and, and improve as an industry as well. Okay. What are some benchmarking numbers that, that you might see out there? And so if any of you have been to either Cheryl Waldner or John Campbell's talks, you've probably seen these about breeding season and how many cows we should expect, cows and heifers we should expect to see pregnant. And so, you know, the popular numbers uh, bouncing around out there is that about 90% of our herd should, should be pregnant at fall preg check and about 95% of our heifers. If we stop to dro drop below some of these numbers, like 90 or 80%, 
for our heifers or cows, then we might have an issue. And, and so by collecting this information, by recording which cows are pregnant and which are open, we can calculate an appropriate number and then determine, okay, where are we sitting as far as our benchmarking number? And do we need to, is some sort of action required, right? Do we need to investigate and see if there's an issue here? Okay. Moving on, I, I can't talk, I can't give a talk without talking about dystocia because it's my, <laughs> my favorite topic to talk about. So dystocia is a difficult or prolonged birth. And so we know again from this benchmarking study that I did, so on average about, the herd average is about 5% of, of calvings are, are assisted. But as to be expected, our heifers tend to be quite a bit higher. So in our study, they are about 13.2% and our cows about 3.2%. Again, benchmarking, we can have these goals to say this is where these are the acceptable levers, levels where we like to see, but we can always improve on that. And again, if we're not writing information down, if we're not recording which calves are being assisted or not, then we don't really know if we have an issue or not here. Okay. Similar with treatment for disease on, on this slide, and the next one is, is for mortality or, or calf death. So according to our benchmarking study, about 9.4% of calves are treated for disease in the pre-weaning period, so before they're weaned. Not, not probably um, a surprise to anybody, the majority of these calves were either treated for scours or diarrhea, or for BRD or, or respiratory disease or pneumonia and other diseases. So again, these, these numbers are, are here as guidelines for you to sort of see, okay, this is what um, producers in Western Canada are, you know, how many calves that they're treating. Did my numbers go above this? Okay, maybe, maybe I need to make some, some management changes here. And then mortality. So Overall pre-weaning mortality is about 4.5% in, in the Western provinces. Um, big thing to note from this slide is these, these stillborn risks, okay? So most calves, if they're gonna die in the pre-weaning period, they're gonna die right within that first uh, day or two of life. So around calving. Calving is a, is a very, um, can be a very dangerous time in a calf's life, right? Because so many of them can die if things go wrong. Um, and so good, good to know these numbers too, even for your own herd to see, okay, you know, are we doing okay? Are we, are we meeting the benchmarks? Or are we, are we going below the benchmark and have less stillbirths? Or potentially did we have a lot of stillbirths this year and maybe we need to look at some of our management decisions where we can make improvements. Okay. So this is just a, a herd example. And I just have to move our faces over on the side so I can see the numbers. So this is a herd. I have a couple of years uh, numbers of, of stillborn calves. So I have last year's 2021, 2020, 2019, and 2018, as well as I have their percent of calves that were weaned by exposed cow. And so what that means is the number of calves that were weaned divided by the number of cows that were exposed to a bull. That's going to give us a better idea of, of our fertility in the herd. And then again, our cow's ability to wean a calf at, at the end. Okay. And so one thing you might be looking at these numbers is what happened here between 2020 and 2021. Okay. If I didn't know this herd, I would say, wow, they had quite a drop in their, the number of stillborn calves and an increase in the number of weaned calves per exposed cow. Okay. And so what happened here? Well, I know this herd specifically and, and what happened for them is that with the, the current management um, that they were doing, they, with those, if anyone here is, is a cow calf producer in Alberta and, and Saskatchewan too, you know that we can get these spring storms that come in and can be quite devastating. We can get, you know, minus 30 one day in March and then the next day will be plus, plus 10 or plus 20, right? And so they were having a lot of issues with a lot of calves, um, especially with these spring storms when they're trying to calve in March. So what did they do? They made a management decision after 2020 to decide that in 2021, they were gonna start calving a month later. They were gonna start calving in April. And because they were able to collect this information in this data, they were able to say, okay, our goal was to decrease the number of stillborn calves. And we did that by changing our, our calving date. And look, we have the numbers to show that at least for this year, 
it helped. It'll be interesting to see what, what this year's calving season looks like as well. We want to continue to monitor this. But again, another way to show you how we can use this data to see if our management decisions are, are working or where we might need to make some of these improvements. Okay, another, another um, place to look at as far as data is, is there a problem? Okay, am I having a problem with my, my herd? And a lot of these questions, some of you, I always laugh when I either get these questions or think these questions in, in my head, um, because we all, we all have them. And, and if any of you know Dr. Jansen, he has probably one of the best memories I have ever, ever known. He can remember something that happened 30 years ago like it was yesterday. I'm different. I, you know, have trouble remembering what I had for lunch yesterday too. So relying on our memory isn't always the best um, when we're trying to make some of these management decisions, right? So especially if we're thinking about individual cows, you know, did that, did, what happened to that cow last year and how did she calve? How was she a good mom? Or didn't that, that heifer's cow have a, have a bad udder too? You know, why are we keeping her in the herd? hard to re rely on our memory unless we're writing this this information down so another good reason to to write information down and, and record data okay and just an example too this is just going through some um just for the sake of time i'm going to skip forward to the, the graph okay so this is a herd where i'm showing you so they they preg check cows in the fall 95 percent of them were pregnant great we're doing a great job okay so now let's look at the data. We're going to record when those calves, the calf date, so, so when those calves were born to those cows, and that's what this graph is, is showing us. So of the proportion of cows that were pregnant, so those 95% cows, okay, we've broken up based on when they calf, their calving date, by these 21-day periods. And those 21-day periods give us an idea as far as the estrus cycle of a cow. Okay, so she comes into heat every 21 days. And so did she get pregnant off of her first heat, her second heat, her third heat, on and on and on. Okay, just by having this information. So if I think about 95% uh, pregnant, pregnant, that sounds pretty good. But when I graph it out by when those calves are actually born, we can tease out some of these issues that might actually be occurring or, or, or being hidden within the data if, if it's not collected. Okay, so a couple of things that I see with this graph is one, they have a very long calving season. I don't know very many producers who like to be calving out 126 days after they start. You're all pretty, pretty exhausted by, by then for sure. <laughs> so, you know, probably would be good to tighten up that, that breeding season. You also see, and uh, Sydney showed a really nice graph of this too, and Dr. Walder and Campbell have also talked about this in their talks too. We like to have about 60% of our cows getting pregnant off of that first cycle, okay? In this herd, we're only having about 15%, and then we jump up to about 25%. So they're having a delay in cows getting pregnant. And then it's, it's a pretty long and, and spread out delay. So some questions that I would have or would want to start to investigate is, is this a fertility issue? Is it a nutrition issue? Maybe these cows aren't cycling at the beginning of the breeding season. Or is this a bull issue? Are we, are we having some issues with either a venereal disease running through this herd or, or bull power, something like this? So by looking at the data afterwards, right, we looked like we were doing pretty good at 95%, but now by teasing out the data, we can look for areas of improvement. Okay, last big one, if you write it down, use it. <laughs> you know, why go through all the, the time that it takes to write something down if you're not going to look at the numbers and you're not going to use it, okay? So perfect example of that is, is birth weight. So in my study, and then again tonight, probably about 50% of producers are recording birth weights. There's lots of different ways that we can use something as simple as a birth weight to, to help us make management decisions, okay? So if there's any seed stock producers out there, obviously they're very keen and, and very excited about measuring um, birth weights because it's a big part of, of calculating those calving needs EPDs for their bulls that they'll sell in their bull sales. Okay, number one reason for producers to, to select a bull is based off of his birth weight. It actually, at least according to my, my benchmarking study, producers will select a bull for their herd to buy based off of his birth weight over his EPD. 
Okay, and so there there could be some issues issues there too. Uh, we know that environment is a big factor in in birth weights as well. And just by looking at a bull's individual birth weight doesn't really give us a lot of information about his calving knees EPDs as well. It's a part of it, but but doesn't give us the complete picture. And so by recording our own calves EPD or birth weights, excuse me. We can, we can then look to if there is an issue, right? If we're this bull that we selected was supposed to only have a 75 pound birth weight, but he's throwing a uh, hundred pound calves, that's uh, something that we want to record and, and make sure that we can make management changes the following year. So maybe we don't put that bull with, with our heifers. Okay. Another big thing, calculating average daily gain and determining our growth of production. Yes, I, I totally understand producers get paid based on what that calf weighs at the end of the year and, and that weaning weight, but wouldn't it be nice to know how efficient your cows are at raising those calves and how efficient your calves are at growing in your environment of how you manage um, by, by calculating this average daily gain. And so by having the birth weight and the weaning weight and then dividing that by, by how old that calf is, we can figure out an average daily gain and see, you know, do we have calves that are reaching 400 weights, you know, in, in five months or is it taking them seven months to get there? And, and do we need to make maybe some nutrition changes or management changes or maybe look at our cows and see maybe our cows aren't doing a great job at growing our, our calves to that, to that weight in a more efficient way. And then also it's very useful when we're looking at these neonatal death problems. So whether we're looking at dystocia, so difficult births, usually caused by large calves, or are we having a lot of small calves and maybe having a loss of opportunity in growth and production from those calves, okay? So just an example of ways that we can use something as simple as measuring a birth weight at, at birth um, in mul multiple ways for our management decisions, okay? And then also looking at the cow too. So calving, calving season, we're mostly focused on that calf. We wanna make sure that they're born alive and they get up and nurse and drink that colostrum and get going and don't develop any, any illnesses. But we also wanna take a look at those cows too because those cows help, help direct the future of our herd as well, especially if we're gonna be selecting and keeping heifers from, from those cows. So we wanna look at udder scoring. This is a pretty ugly picture of, a, of an udder. I hope too many of you don't see udders like, like that. And dam, dam temperament too, you know, what kind of cow is she? Is she, and it's hard sometimes to measure right around calving. I understand there's a lot of hormones that are, that are changing and, and going on, but you know, is she the kind of cow that that's easy to handle, easy to run through, doesn't get really stressed when she goes through the chute or is she always sort of high strung? Um, Cause there is some research here that we've done at the University of Calgary and, and other research institutions as well that have shown that, you know, looking at udder scoring and dam temperament can really impact what our heifers look like in the future and how those heifers grow their own calves as well. So again, don't forget to take a, we're looking at the calf, but don't forget to take a look at the cow, cow as well. And this is just an example of a picture of a of um, different ways that we can score, score udders. And there's lots of information, um, Kajal Devani, who, who did her PhD here at the University of Calgary, who's also associated with the Angus Association, can tell you lots more about the heritability and longevity of udder scoring in, in your herds. Okay, so with that, I'm just gonna wrap this up so we can hear from Mark, but my big take home messages for everybody is to start small, but build upon it, right? So if you're gonna, if you're gonna start collecting more information, don't try and collect everything at once in one calving season. You're gonna be overwhelmed. You're not gonna have time to do it. You're gonna quit probably a week in once you start getting a lot of calves, right? So add in one or two things to start measuring the first year and then build upon that, okay? That went pretty well. I gained this information. Next year, I wanna look into this factor. So maybe this year I'm gonna measure birth weight. Next year, I'm gonna start scoring udders of calves. Okay, develop these SMART goals. And the big part of the SMART, at least for me, is the measurable part of it, okay? Make goals that we can measure so we can see that improvement in your herd. And lastly, if you don't write it down, you can't use it, right? We don't, we don't have the best memories um, out there. And so if it's something that, that you wanna use, if it's a question that you have, write the information down so that we can use it, use it on in the future. And with that, this, this is just a brief acknowledgement for, for my sponsors for that study. And of course, BCRC, who I appreciate having me, having me talk. 
And I'm not taking questions now, although I wish cows would also record their own information about when they're going to calve and whether they would need assistance or not. Um, but with that, Sydney, I will stop sharing and um, turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jennifer. That was great. I definitely learned a lot. And I think you did a great job of kind of highlighting that keeping these records, it definitely helps not only to identify these problems, but also identify opportunities. Because if you don't know what you got, then there's nothing you can really do about it. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, actually, before I do that, I just want to remind anyone, everyone again, but if you have any questions for Dr. Pearson, please ask them in the Q&A function and we will get back to them um, during our live Q&A period after Mark has finished presenting. Okay, so now I will introduce Mark. Um, so Mark Heimer is the owner and operator of Box H Farms in Gladmar, Saskatchewan. Mark, his wife Laura and their family run a cow-calf operation and direct market grass-fed beef, pastured pork and honey. Over the past 20 years, their farm has evolved from a conventional mixed grain and cattle operation to a forage-based business that focuses on the health of the land um, to grow nourishing food. So please join me in welcoming Mark as he provides insight on his record-keeping strategy for his operation. All right, I'm just, hello everyone. I'm just getting my screen sorted out here. Are you able to see that, Sydney? Yep, I can see it. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, like Sydney said, my name is uh, Mark Heimer. Um, I ranch in southern Saskatchewan with my family. Um, we are located just north of the U.S. border, so we're way down south, uh, the very south end of of Saskatchewan, um, reasonably dry and arid area, but it's perfect for growing grass. So that's what we do with it. And we uh, we run a cow calf operation and uh, typically calve out between about 250 to, to 300 animals uh, every year. We calve uh, in May and June and we calve out on pasture. Um, it was a decision we made quite a few years ago. It was, it was a little more gradual than the, the example that, that Jennifer gave. Um, but uh, we really like, like the way that the cows, uh, cows behave on pasture. Um, everything just kind of seems to happen without us and uh, we're perfectly fine with that. Um, we find that there's quite a few less Quite a few less problems and a lot less intervention and uh, that uh, that is that is more than fine. We try to tag our calves within about 12 to 24 hours of when they're born um, for a couple reasons. One is just to be able to keep everything straight as it's happening and another is just the the calves at that age are, are very manageable so to uh, to just punch a few few tags in and uh, and put a ring on is is just a short, quick and uh, and seamless process most of the time. Not not all of the time, but ideally, and uh, and we're able to get that done and uh, and stay on top of it as we as we go through the calving season. And it's usually just myself that does the the majority of the tagging. So like we saw in, uh, in Jennifer's presentation, uh, we started with the, the standard pocketbook calving book. Um, we had uh, just recorded the cows that calved as they calved and, uh, and that, that was the only, only method we had for recording for many years. Uh, then I got a little more interested in, in uh, record keeping and, and data collection and we migrated to also transferring that onto a, a spreadsheet as well. And I liked the ability to be able to, to manipulate some of the numbers and to, uh, to summarize some of the things that were happening. Um, so I, I 
migrated again once again and and worked with a, a database that I, I entered the information into. And this is all while still having the paper calving book that uh, I entered everything in as as it as they were being born. Um, in the very end, uh, because my father was 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 helping me as well, I was uh, recording things in in the paper calving book, um, then transferring from that paper calving book to another copy uh, for my father, and then in the evening I would record things into the database, and it it just got to be a little more a little more than I felt was was worth it. Uh, when it comes to the amount of time uh, that it took to record everything. And um, it was definitely, we're definitely able to see that there was some transcription errors, uh, especially at the, the late night uh, database entry from the calving book. Um, so we, we dropped that method and uh, I knew I wanted to, to keep doing records, but I needed it to be simpler. So we, we tried a, a spreadsheet on on a smartphone. So what I use is uh, is a database or a spreadsheet called Numbers. Um, it's uh, it's software that works on an Apple phone, and it's it's essentially just the Apple version of Excel. And uh, that's something we've been using for about ten years now, and uh, it's it's evolved over time, but but we really like it. <clears throat> So this is a, uh, a snapshot of the, the spreadsheet that we use to record a, a lot of our, our calving information. Um, now, keep in mind that this, uh, this snapshot is just a, a picture of, of the one tab of the spreadsheet. Uh, there's also other tabs that I use for uh, cow records and for um, important dates, uh, vaccine records, and uh, treatment records, keeping track of my bulls, other things like that. Um, and this this tab is strictly for the the calving season. And uh, as well, there is also, um, if you could see it off to the left, a lot more columns for later on in the calf's life for weaning weights and uh, the dates of weaning. Uh, we record all sorts of other things, but one of the advantages of a spreadsheet is that when you're not using uh, some of the, the columns or some of the, the fields that you, you want to look at later but you don't need right now, say as in calving time, you're able to hide all of that information and it, it really helps, helps to declutter the uh, the spreadsheet, which is important when you're when you're looking at a uh, a small screen on your phone. So we try really hard, or I tried really hard, to set this up so that it is very quick to enter the information for a, a calf um, after I've tagged it. Uh, I I've never timed it, but I, I'm assuming it would be around 30 to 45 seconds that it would take me to to enter in all the information that we enter um, after a calf has been tagged. Um, so that means a little bit of prep ahead of time. So this spreadsheet, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, column going down is is a list of uh, the tag numbers for our cows. Uh, so we know um, which cows are going to calve and we uh, enter them, pre-enter them into the spreadsheet in, a, in an order that we're, we're kind of accustomed to, that we've, we've got used to looking at them at, which is by age first and then, uh, then by tag number. Um, so all of the, the cows that are gonna calve are already pre-entered into the, into the spreadsheet and, and that part is done as well as, as you can see throughout the, the spreadsheet that's, that's mostly blank right now, there is uh, things like pulled, horned, um, calving ease, and, and other things that are already entered. Um, a lot of columns that that aren't aren't usually that different from one another. Uh, if we use an Angus bull 
Um, we don't typically get many horns. So the spreadsheet allows me to set um, polled as a default. So it just, all the calves are polled unless I change them to, uh, to horned. Um, uh, same as the calving ease, we expect most of our calves to come without issue. So the default is, is unassisted and we can change it if we, if we have trouble, but uh, putting some defaults in there really, it, uh, it speeds up the uh, amount of time it takes to enter in the, the calves uh, at a time when uh, you're usually thinking just about as much uh, about the next calf that you wanna tag that's getting up and running away as you are trying to enter in the, the last of your, of your information. Um, so the way this spreadsheet is set up, when I am checking cows before I tag, I will make sure that uh, as I see a calf being born or as I see the cow is calved, I enter in the date um, that, the, that it happens on. Um, and because it's a, a spreadsheet and you're able to, you're able to format the, uh, the cells that you're gonna be entering things into, um, the spreadsheet already knows that you're going to put a date into that field. So when you double tap on that square, it pops up in a, in a screen that gives you options for entering in dates like uh, a month and a day. And uh, in the case that we like to use, it has a, a button that is today's date. So basically uh, you just double tap it, it pops up, gives you today's date, uh, you hit that button and it it enters it and it's as long as you as long as you stay current it's it's very quick and easy um, i also like to play around with some formulas on spreadsheets so and we tag our calves the same uh, number and, and letter as the uh, the cows so they match so uh, i set up a formula in the calf id cell so that as soon as i enter in a date uh, in that row it automatically coppers, copies the uh, cow tag number into the calf tag number ID. Um, it's not, wouldn't be the end of the world to have to fill it in, but it was kind of fun to figure out how to make it work. And uh, it's just one less cell to, uh, to enter when you're, when you're trying to get done quickly. Um, I guess something else I should mention too, before I move on, uh, you can probably see at the top of the screen, um, because it's a spreadsheet, once again, you're able to um, have a header that allows you to tally things as you go. So I've put some, uh, some formulas in that allow me to keep track of how many cows I have left to calve, how many live calves. Um, the, the square here that says 1.5%. That gives me a running total of the percentage of uh, percentage done. I am calving. So, uh, like Jennifer had mentioned in her presentation, um, when I know I'm done the first cycle in my uh, in my calving season, I've went through the first 21 days, then I can have a peek at that that number, and that tells me how many how many cows I've had calve in the first cycle. And it's it's uh, it's not necessary, but it is, it is something that's kind of uh, nice to be aware of as, it, as it's happening. And once you get it set up, uh, it's just automatically calculated. So it's, uh, it's not really that much effort at all. So like I said, I, uh, I enter all the, the dates for the, the cows that have, have calved currently. And then when it comes time to to tag, I sort the spreadsheet. And uh, the sort that I have here uh, forces all the cows that have just recently calved uh, into the very top of the spreadsheet, right up to the top. So the end result is that all of the, the calves that I'm going out to tag are all kind of conveniently laid out right on the top of my screen. Uh, where I can, uh, I don't have to go flipping through the, the spreadsheet to try and find them, which is is uh, very convenient because uh, it, well, anyone who's scrolled through their phone looking for something knows how frustrating it can be. Um, 
so yeah, and then once I get to to tagging the so I will the the system I use is I, I go ahead and I tag the calf, and then before I before I let it get too far away, I just I I record all this information. So when it comes to this, all the different stuff that I record, uh, the CCIA number and the birth weight. Um, like I said before, because uh, spreadsheet, you're able to set the format for what you're entering in that cell. Um, when I go to enter in uh, both the CCIA number and the, the birth weight, uh, the spreadsheet knows that I'm going to be entering in a number. So it pops up a keypad with a uh, number pad with um, just numbers right there. Uh, you just punch them in and it's very quick and simple. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Also, when it comes to one of the one of the reasons that I chose numbers as a spreadsheet was because of the, uh, the drop down boxes that it has available. So when it comes time to uh, enter in things like calf color, I have the uh, ability to to modify a list um, and put it in a drop down box so I can select from any color that I want. And I also have the ability to, to uh, make sure that the colors and the fields that are the most commonly used are up at the top. So they're, they're convenient and they're, and they're quick. And so that's what I've done as well when it comes to things like uh, calf sex and calving ease and uh, the calf status, or uh, it's uh, whether it's single or a twin, and uh, like I said, on some of these, like calving ease and um, the born as status, I have them set as defaults. But if if it's if they didn't calve on their own, if they if they needed uh, assistance, or if it's a twin instead of a, a single, uh, it's it's pretty quick and easy to to adjust that. Um, another one of the things we record, um, and it's, it's not so much because, uh, I need to know whether they're alive or, or, or dead as I'm, as I'm tagging them, but, uh, it's just their, their pre wean status is a, a column I use to help sort through the calves, uh, after calving season, just to kind of lump up all of the, the calves that are alive and well, uh, and separate them from the ones that, that didn't make it or, uh, or the ones, the calves that we sold. It's just kind of a, a function that helps me uh, better use the information. Uh, a few of the other things that we record. Um, and the nice thing about a spreadsheet is, is if you decide it's important and you want to record it, you just add a column and, and you start recording it. And if you decide it's not important, you hide the column and you stop. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty versatile. So uh, years ago, we started keeping track of um, a system we call just handled. And basically that's, did I have to touch the calf? Uh, was it born on its own, sucked on its own, never needed to be looked at? Um, it's, it's a nine. And on a sliding scale all the way down to one, which would be a, a bottle fed calf that, that lived in our corrals all summer. Um, it's just a, a tool we use to identify the calves that the calves and the cows that uh, were the biggest headache during calving season, just to make sure, like, uh, like Jen said in the presentation before, just to make sure we remember uh, who was causing us the headaches. Um, we also score the udder um, with uh, teat size and uh, and suspension rating system, quite similar to, to the, the chart that, that Jennifer had there in the, in the previous session here. Um, I really, really like um, scoring the udder at the time of birth. I think, it's, uh, I think it's just a fantastic opportunity to evaluate the, uh, the, the udder of the cow. And uh, it's, it's probably one of the most used um, one of the most used piece of pieces of data that we collect. Uh, and it's any time that you uh, are just observing your your livestock more often, I think it's a it's an absolute benefit. 
Um, we also record uh, utter baldness. Uh, it is supposed to be linked to uh, butter fat content in the milk. Um, we have never used it for a management decision, but I thought it was interesting. Um, it's quite quick to record and uh, it's, it's just one of those things that uh, it's interesting to see the, the diversity in the, in the cattle uh, between, the, between the different stages of, of how, how much hair and how bald the udder is. Uh, just, uh, just again, just another, another thing to observe and, and, and to be aware of that probably wouldn't happen and probably wouldn't be seen if you weren't taking the time to, to write it down and record it. Uh, we do also keep track of, uh, of temperament and of uh, if they're uh, an exceptionally early shedder or uh, the opposite. Um, these are also set to default just because we find on average um, the majority of our cattle are, uh, are fairly level-headed when it comes to tagging. Um, I wouldn't be able to tag them in the pasture if they weren't. And uh, and yeah, and, and as far as shedding, we just, it's, it's once again, it's, it's not something we really use that heavily now for a management decision, but it's, it's just another thing that we can observe and, and that we do observe more because um, we're looking at it to record some, some information on it. Yes, and this is the, the, the system and the, the scale I use for, for Scoring the udders, which is, I think, quite similar to the one that, uh, that Jennifer had in her slide. Um, so when it comes to using the data that we collect, um, we use it for helping us to sort calves into pastures um, or helping us to know which calves are supposed to be in which pastures when you've got the random calf running through the yard and, and uh, no one knows where he's supposed to go. It, that, that's been quite helpful. Um, we use it for uh, culling decisions. Uh, if we need to uh, scale back our numbers a little bit, uh, we get really hard on, on utter, utter sizes. Uh, and typically uh, what we found is the, uh, the really poor udders tend to correlate with the, uh, the problems we have when it comes to handling uh, of the of the calves. Um, we use some of the information when it comes to retaining heifers, trying to avoid um, really bad temperament, really bad udders, um, and for actual numbers when it comes to knowing if you've got enough, uh, enough steers for a load, if you've got um, the right amount of cattle for the, the vaccine that you bought, or uh, or just a bunch of various things like that. Um, I didn't, I forgot to put a slide up for it, but uh, just quickly I'll, I'll rush through the kind of the, the pros and cons of, of keeping records on, on a phone um, versus a, a paper system. So uh, it is, is really quick to use once you get it set up. Um, it's very accessible, it can be shared to to as many people as you want. Um, it usually is safe from being run through the washing machine. So uh, uh, that is always a good thing. But even if it was, uh, because it's uh, backed up on the cloud, on, on the phone, if you set it that way, it's, uh, it's always safe. Uh, some of the downsides of it is, it does take a little bit of, of basic tech skills to, to get it operating. Um, it is not any more fun to have the, uh, a phone to enter in the calving records in, uh, when it's raining or snowing or muddy than it is a, a paper book. Um, so that's, that's not always ideal either. And, uh, for as, as streamlined as I've tried to set things up, um, the anomalies of calving make make it slow down quite a bit and, and, and make it a little more cumbersome. So things like twins or grafting a calf from one cow to another, um, it, it makes for a, a, a little, little extra data entry and it, it slows things down a little bit. But uh, overall, um, 
we're we're really happy with uh, with how it's been able to allow us to to keep track of everything we want to keep track of and uh, and not spend a whole bunch of time doing it. Um, so that pretty much wraps wraps up my uh, my spiel. Uh, thank you for uh, for suffering through that and. Uh, I guess I'll pass it back to to Sydney so she can uh, see if anyone has any questions. Thanks, Mark. There was no suffering here. You did a great job. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, and like he said, um, the floor is now open for the Q and A session. Um, so if you haven't answered your um, haven't asked your questions yet, feel free to input them now. Um, but we are just going to jump in. So this is a question um, potentially for both of you to answer. Um, why do you think the computer or handheld device um, acceptance or adoption is low compared to the rest of the record keeping tools or systems? Uh, I, I could jump in really quickly. You know, I, I think a lot of it comes down to is what you're used to to using. You know, as, as I mentioned too, I'm I'm a hand note taker type of person, and so anytime you have to learn a new software, uh, start start to change something, change is hard, right? And so I think I think a, a lot of that um, has has slowed down the progress as well. And I think Mark probably has some some great uh, antidotes from his own experience too of, of switching from the paper copy to the the computer copy and how you know those first steps were were probably a little challenging but eventually once once you learn to get all the kinks worked out it it seems to streamline things um mark what do you what yeah what went through your mind when you switched <laughs> well i i i have to confess that i i like technology and i like I like fooling around and formatting and, and getting things set up in a way that I can I can make make better use of the information that I'm collecting. So I'm I might not be typical in that way when it comes to ranchers, but uh, I know it is um, it is a lot easier to stay with what you're used to. And uh, I mean, it it really wasn't that many years ago that even though we did still have smartphones they weren't as good as as what we have now um the technology is a lot better it's a lot easier to use now and uh, i would imagine that it will the percentage of people that are using it will will increase but uh but yeah it's it is it is a little daunting when you first start with it thanks you thank you both um this um, question is for Mark, um, just around the practicalities of using Apple Numbers. So, can you, sh uh, pardon me, can you share that spreadsheet between two devices, between two phones or phone and laptop? Yes. Um, so, uh, I have uh, because it's on it's it's set up on the cloud, so. I have my iPad set up, so it automatically, uh, it pretty much on its own instantly syncs with, uh, with my iPad. So I'm able to, to use those two devices completely seamlessly without any, without any effort at all. Um, when you're going between two devices that have different, uh, different accounts, different Apple accounts, that's when it gets a little bit trickier. Um, Sydney had asked me this question earlier and uh, it is possible to link up the spreadsheet so more than one person can contribute to it. But to enable that function, you have to um, be online uh, when you're entering data. And no matter how many meetings we have, my cows will not calve up on a hill where I have cell service. They refuse and they calve down in the brush where there's no cell service and uh, that it just it it doesn't work for us. So, but we are able to. Uh, it is just as easy as, as as sharing a copy of it through email and or through a text and uploading it, and then it's it's a an absolute 
duplicate of uh, of the copy that came from the original. Thanks, Mark. Um, okay, so this question is, um, when determining your cycle, do you start from the date the first cow calved or the date they were due to calve? So I believe this is in reference to um, the 21 day heat cycle. If I can get my microphone to work. Yeah, and it's it's actually, it ends up being more challenging than, than it sounds and Mark can probably account to this as well. Cause there's always this first couple of calves, right? They come a couple weeks early before everybody else. And if you start from when, from when they calve, so generally we go based off of when the calves are born rather than the, um, the due date, I think, or, or when they were bred, I think that was the, the question. We, we calculate that based off of um, when they're born, if we're looking at the calving birth dates. Um, and so, yeah, usually when I did my survey actually and was trying to, to ask produ producers a similar question, we had to define it in a way. So we said, you know, um, that the calving season started when at least, you know, two or more calves had had been had been born because as I mentioned you always get those couple of early ones that that aren't premature they're they're normal but they they tend to come a couple of of weeks early so generally it's yeah after you've had at least one or two calves born that's sort of where where we start that otherwise you're right you do kind of get that that prolonged first cycle and, and it may may change your data a little bit too right the whole garbage in garbage out yeah. Mark, when do you guys start your um, data for, for the 21 day cycle? Whenever it makes the numbers look the best. I, uh, I have nothing constructive to add to this. I, I am constantly confused by, by the right time to add. I, I know we've uh, compared to, to when they should start calving. Um, we've had as little as as one to two percent before that date, and as many as fifteen before that date, uh, just depending on the gestation. I think some bulls are able to to speed that up. Um, that uh, yeah, I, I do not have a good answer for that. It's uh, it's 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 a little bit iffy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's hard to predict. No, it's it's normal biology too, right? Cows can can calve with normal calves up to two weeks early and two weeks late, and everything can be can be fine. So we we say that 280 or 280 do gestation length, but you're right. There there's nutritional impacts, uh, environment impacts, bull genetic impacts as well. So it's it can be challenging. I agree. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, we have one question asking if there, um, if you either of you are aware of cow data programs that are user friendly and free or um, inexpensive, which is a question that I know we get a lot as well. So, if any of you have insight, I'm only laughing because you know it's the three. It's got to be free, cheap, and easy, right? Or or uh, and and quick. Um, so my my point, and I'll let Mark because uh, he's looked at some of these programs as well. So so my opinion is yes, there there are a lot of programs out there. They vary in price, in in user friendliness, um, amount of data that you can collect, amount of time that you can use them for. Um, I from from my point of view, I would say investigate a lot of them, look into them, see see what kind of information you want to collect and how you're going to use that. See if there's any programs out there that might work best for you, or you might be someone like like Mark who goes and builds his own home spreadsheet as well. So there's um, there's so much there's hundreds of programs out there, and so you just got to start start looking through them all. Yeah, I agree completely, uh, and I don't think it's unreasonable, cheap, uh, easy to use, free. I, I think I think that that should be available, but uh, I looked at a bunch of, uh, of different ones. This is a few years ago that I looked now. I'm sure there's, there's many more and, and many superior now. Um, 
part of the reason that I decided to go the way we did was because it always seemed like, regardless of how good the, the program was, there was always a part of it that wasn't going to completely conform with the way we wanted to keep records. It was going to be short something or it was going to going to keep track of something a little different than what we were used to. And uh, I thought if I was going to be if I was going to be disappointed in, in the way that the things were were compiled, um, that that was the kind of expectations that I could handle when it came to building my own. So that's that's kind of where I went from there. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a practical question. Um, I think both of you could answer this. So how are um, how are you specifically or others in the industry measuring birth weight out on pasture? Uh, I, I can start because there's there's lots of ways, and then Mark can say how how he does it. Um, so probably estimating birth weight. So visual observation and, and guesstimating is what I like to call it is probably the most common way that people are me measuring birth weight. Um, some people are really good at it, actually. Um, we've, we've done some studies and, and looked at some, some people are, are pretty spot on when you finally put that calf on the scale. And other people, you tend to over or, or underestimate birth weights as well. So there's, there's quite a variability there as, as well that can impact your data. The other two common ways, so one would be a scale, and there's lots of different scales out there. I've seen them attached to the back of side-by-sides or Jeeps or trucks or your produce at the, at the grocery store. Um, there's the flat ones that, that you walk or slide the calf sled on and, and weigh the calf that way. Um, those are going to give you very accurate numbers as, as far as what the birth weight is. And then there are some, some devices out there too that are, that are also estimates but a little bit more accurate than our, our visual. Um, estimates. And so those are going to be like the, the calf chest circumference tape measurements like we do for horses or, or other species. It goes around the chest of the calf and based on its diameter, it estimates the weight. Um, and then there's also another one that goes around the hoof or at the, the coronary band and can estimate the weight. With both of those tape measurements, there is research to show though that, that generally with um, small calves, it tends to overestimate their weight. And with large calves, it tends to underestimate their weight. So, you know, they're quick and easy and, and cheap, but uh, I would say stick with one way of measuring. Uh, don't use all, all three or, or lots of different ways. Uh, stick with a way to measure and then use that systematically through, through the calving season. Yeah, Mark, how do you guys measure your, your birth weights? Um, we have done it a ver variety of ways. Um, currently, uh, it is, is basically just an estimate. Um, and then there are a few. So we, when we tag on pasture, um, we pull up with a quad um, and just tag the calf. And as long as the cow is cool with that, then that's how it happens. And whether it's a 75 or 85 pound calf, uh, I can live with that, that not knowing. Um, but there are a few cows that uh, do not let you just walk up and tag their calf. So we have a, uh, a kind of a, a safety cage we pull for, for those animals. And in the back of it, we have a, a kind of a suspension scale mounted. 7L, I believe, is the, the, the makers of it. And that, that gives us an idea kind of, so everything that we have to handle, we make sure that we, we scale so we can Kind of be a little bit better at our estimations but uh, really we're um when it comes to that we we want to we want to know which calves are exceptionally large and we want to know which calves are exceptionally small and uh and yeah a lot of the ones in the middle um it's not exact but uh we're we're satisfied with an estimation and as long as no one checks it's very accurate Thanks, Mark and Jennifer. Um, so it uh, looks like we just have one last question here and then we'll let everyone go for the evening. Um, but what, um, is there any relationship between cow temperament and calf weight, birth weight, and weaning weight? 
So I think this can kind of be um, answered a little more or asked a little more broadly is like, is there any trait that's measurable that is also related to um, cow temperament? Yeah, I mean, I, well, first of all, temperament for me, you know, we all have that one cow in the back of our mind. For me, it's 166 and she <laughs> ran me up and over the, the fence post. So, um, you know, that's, that's for me as a, as a check to, to get on the truck, but um, there is, there is some research looking at, at temperament. More of the temperament research is actually in the feedlot. So actually looking at, um, shoot exit speeds of steers and heifers in the feedlot and how that associates with their gain, weight gain. And actually that research has shown that, you know, those animals that, that are harder to handle, that have faster shoot exit speed. So, so want to get out there as fast as possible, right? Don't like to be handled or, or contained, tend to not grow and, and gain as much weight and have as good carcass weight traits as those the, that are a little bit calmer. Um, there is some research to also looking at, um, at uh, uh, cow temperament and and actually, we, we have a research project going on this summer that, that's looking at handling of calves and how that impacts their, their later temperament as well. So if we handle them at birth, how does that make them uh, handling when they're older, going through calf processing, when they're weaned? And then if we keep them as replacement heifers, um, how might that impact them when they become mothers, mothers themselves? So there's limited research there, but there is some that shows that it, that it can be heritable and that, yeah, those cows that are a little bit more skittish, not, not the greatest temperament, um, you know, one, it makes it hard for us to handle them and, and treat their calves, but also it, it may impact their, their calves as well. Mark, do you, you collect that information? Do you use that as far as, um, who you're going to keep or as far as who, you know, if you're going to keep their daughter or, or how do you use that information? We don't, don't always use it, but we definitely are mindful of it. Um, yeah, I, I don't like all things that are, that uh, are in the, the scope of heritability. It's, it's not a hundred percent one way or the other. We definitely see if there's a very uh, headstrong heads up, a uh, very wide flight zone cow, uh, there is a strong possibility that a, a calf from it is, is going to be that way as well. Um, and that's is something that we try to avoid at all costs. Um, we, we manage our cattle with uh, a single wire poly wire in a lot of cases, and uh, there is just no room for animals that move, move quickly. Um, everyone needs to be slow and calm. So, uh, so that's, but yeah we don't yeah it's it's one of those things that we're, we're always aware of it i like i uh i kind of use it as a as a strike system if there's a cow that that acts up she gets recorded she she moves from average to uh, excitable um and if there's a cow that shows up and i go to change her in the records and she's already at excitable then that that's it she's gone that that's too many strikes and it's, uh, there's just too many quiet cows to put up with wild ones. Fair enough. I don't think anyone will argue with you on that one. <laughs> so I just want to thank our two presenters for doing such an amazing job with their presentations and answering our questions. Thank you again so much. Um, and thank you all for participating this evening. It's been great. Um, and just as a reminder, our next webinar will be on February 9th. Um, and that one, just so I don't butcher the title, um, is on a grazing game plan, how to develop a grazing plan. Um, and just to reiterate, that is on February 9th at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So thank you again to our presenters and to everyone for participating, and we hope to see you guys very soon. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.